Hurst. And I'm Jim Carney. And this is EdCast, a program created and produced by educators for everyone interested in education. Despite decades of school reform, including the much debated Bush era No Child Left Behind Act, the academic achievement gap between minority and disadvantaged students and their white counterparts continues to exist. What's causing this persistent gap and why is it so difficult to close? Today I'll speak with Professor Pedro Noguera, a renowned expert on public education, to discuss the challenges faced by schools and what it will take to remove these educational disparities. And later in the program, I'll visit some schools that are making a difference in closing that gap. But now, to Linda and her guest in the studio. My guest today is Pedro Noguera, professor of sociology at New York University. Professor Noguera is a noted authority on school reform and ways of closing the academic achievement gap. He is the author of numerous books, including Unfinished Business, Closing the Achievement Gap in Our Schools, and Professor Noguera has published over 150 research articles and reports on topics such as urban school reform, student achievement, and school choice. Welcome to EdCast, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Linda. How serious is the achievement gap? What are we talking about? Well, it's, uh, it's very serious. It's, um, it's pervasive throughout our society. That is, that uh, in, in, in most schools and in most communities, uh, there's a strong correspondence between a child's race and socioeconomic status, and that's an important mm -hmm. qualifier, and how well they'll perform academically. Uh, there are some exceptions to that pattern. Immigrant kids often are an exception, but that's generally the pattern throughout American society. And how big a gap is it? What's the differences in performances between these kids and other more advantaged children? Are we really seeing them well, really th coming in a lot lower? That's right. There's, it's, and it's what I like to remind people, it's manifest throughout the system. So we see it in kindergarten. So it, that's very important to recognize that this is so it starts that early. even before school. It's a preparation gap. And okay. We are one of few industrialized countries that does not provide access to uh, preschool for example, so that shows up in our schools. So literally middle class kids come to school knowing hundreds more words than poor children. Uh, but it, it gets compounded throughout the years in school. Uh, and uh, you see it in graduation rates mm -hmm. where um, about 75 uh, percent nationally of, of white students are graduated from high school, almost 80 percent for Asian students. Mm -hmm. Um, closer to 40 percent for uh, Latino and, and African American students. So it's a, it, it has real implications yeah. for our economy, it has uh, implications for uh, quality of life for the families that don't receive a good education. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, it's good that we've become focused on it uh, as a nation in the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, but I think we're still not doing what it would take to begin to address okay, it. Okay, so let's start to address it. Let's first isolate again some of the causes. You've alluded to some of them already. Maybe you'd like to just highlight for us what you see as some of the causes and then of course what you see right. as some of the ways we could address this. So I, I like to remind people that in many ways the achievement gap is an educational manifestation of social inequality. Right? And all that means is that kids who have less <laughs> tend to get less when they're in school. Uh, it starts because we spend less money on the poorest kids than we do on the wealthier kids. Uh, that means they have access to less qualified teachers in many cases, in fewer resources. School, in the public school districts as well. Absolutely, okay, right. absolutely. I mean, the discrepancies, yeah, okay. for example, between the South Bronx and Scarsdale mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are wide in just in per people spending. Uh, so it starts there, but then it gets compounded by just the practices we use within schools and the fact that the families that are struggling to get by can provide less for their children right. at home. So even something like homework, right? We might, homework is an equity issue. That's because if you don't have access to a computer, if you don't have access to a, a parent with a college degree and with time to help mm -hmm. you, you're consistently at a disadvantage compared to the kids who have that kind of support. And that's just one example of the ways in which inequity in our society is perpetuated in our schools. So what can we do? I, I don't see that inequity disappearing <laughs> overnight, certainly. Right. So what do you think we can do in the interim, or what should be done? We've certainly been trying, and right. I think we've been failing. So what well, should we well, do? Well, the first thing we have to stop doing is stop pretending that schools can solve this by themselves. Okay. Okay. Um, what's very troubling right now is the tendency, and we're seeing at every level, from the federal government to local, to blame teachers for this. Absolutely. Right? And that's the drumbeat. <laughs> you know, it, until we can improve the teachers, nothing's going to change. 
Absolutely. We, I mean, the quality of teaching is clearly important, and there's no way you can begin to close this gap unless you can improve instruction. Right. But if you ignore all the other factors and only focus on the teachers, you're not going to solve this problem. Um, I, I'm troubled by the kind of simplistic and narrow-minded thinking that has led us to think this is all about breaking teacher unions oh, and, 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 and beating down teachers because we have to ask ourselves, where are we going to draw the next generation of teachers from who will stay in the profession? Uh, and, and I say that because a lot of people think Teach for America is the answer. Teach for America, I mean, the av typical person stays in uh, teaching for two years. Uh, I, was, I was talking to a group of uh, Teach for America uh, uh, fellows who are actually teaching in the schools now, 300 of them yeah. at, at Pace. And uh, I asked them, how many of them felt that they were qualified to do what they're doing? And more, no more than two or three raised their hand in a room of 300. This because we're, we're taking the least prepared people and putting them in the most challenging classrooms. There is absolutely no research to support that strategy. Well, that is a whole <laughs> movement today, as you know, not just in Teach for America, but teacher preparation programs in general are coming under fire for not being quick enough. The New York City Teaching Fellows is another example, right. I believe, of a program that takes you, throws you in the class. But of course, this whole issue of teacher quality is another Huge issue. issue. But I certainly. You're right, the drumbeat for, you know, get rid of unions, get rid of seniority, right. get rid of tenure, that's the cause, and that's you're saying right. that that is not the cause. No, and, I, right. and let me acknowledge, too, that it's mm -hmm. not as though we can say that, that those teachers who are produced by schools of education, like NYU or Teachers College, like or, me. Right, <laughs> NYU. are necessarily better prepared, because there's a wide gap between the pre preparation they receive at the university and what they actually experience in what the classroom right. schools. The districts are implicated in this because school districts will consistently put the newest, least experienced people in the most difficult classrooms. Right. And they will take their most senior people and save them for the more privileged kids. Well, it's true that seniority <laughs> does come into that a that's little right. bit. That's right. Some of the teachers also say that's where they want to be. That's and right. that is so, but, so that's issues. why I said okay, we have so to avoid the issue. tendency that, to blame. So let's not right. demonize the teacher. <laughs> right. well, what could we do that would close this gap somewhat? Well, there's a lot we can do. Okay, let's um, look at A it. lot of <clears> what we have to focus on is how to create the school conditions that are most condu conducive to good teaching and learning. And what would that be? Um, that means providing good support to teachers around curriculum. Um, okay. Because we have a lot of teachers that they may be trained in pedagogy, but they're not trained in teaching that pedagogy to the children in front of them. We're also right? teaching to a test a lot lately, if well, I Well, that, that's, that's a problem, too. We'll go back to that later, but all right. Right, that's a problem, too, because we're using assessment in a very distorted and troubling manner now. It should be a tool, not a... Kids Weapon. don't get smarter <laughs> by being tested, right? Um, but I, I think we need to look at those learning conditions. Okay. We need to look at, at how to provide teachers with more support. We need to look at the non-academic needs of children, okay. right? Things like health, nutrition. <clears throat> um, we have a lot of kids who come to school who are stressed out, stressed out because their families lost their job or lost their home. We need, we need counselors, social workers who are working with teachers so that teachers can focus on the academics, but someone else is addressing the non-academic needs of children. And so do you believe that school, I, I know we've had some, uh, we've talked about some programs here, um, some school programs on this show, uh, Turnaround for Children, Pam Cantor was on sure. here, and she provides a school team where people come into the school, stay in the school, and provide a lot of mental health services for families. Is that the kind of thing that you think we need to have throughout? Uh -uh. Because uh, obviously it's difficult for families to get those services. Sure. So yes, we, we need to help? provide those kind of wraparound social services uh, for children and families, and schools is one place to provide them. But let's not, uh, we can't go too far down okay. that line. We still have to stay focused on academics, right. because that is the reason why the kids are in school. And what we have to be careful is that uh, we don't start to believe that because they are poor or because they are from disadvantaged backgrounds that they can't achieve or they right. can't learn. So we shouldn't have low expectations, obviously. That's right. Okay. And we need to make sure. But, but expectations is only part of it. You also have to really focus on the conditions. You would have to make sure that we are creating the right learning conditions, and there are examples. But tell me, in your words, what do you see as the ideal condition? Well, the ideal condition starts with a strong uh, principle, and what all that means is someone who has a vision um, of, of what that school w should look like, where they're going as a school, mm -hmm. and who is able to inspire and support the staff, Okay. right, and, and hold them accountable for what they do. <clears throat> Uh, from there, it, 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 you need a strong team around that principle uh, mm -hmm. of, of other administrators, uh, uh, of teachers, support staff, uh, whether it be custodians, receptionists, classroom aides. All of that team is important because 
Uh, it takes uh, many people to make a good school function, and the larger the school, the more people okay. required. Would that be preferable to having a school run by teachers? You know, that's been in the news lately where teachers are running the school. I'm, I'm troubled by that uh, idea because the kinds of skills you need to be an effective principal are very different from the kinds of skills you need to, need to be an effective okay. teacher. Good point. So. Okay. <laughs> no, I just wanted to bring that up because right. I'm sure you've seen that. that sure, no, I've seen okay. it. So, all right, so we need a good team. We need a principal with a, a vision. How will that translate into helping the students with their academics. And where do you see some of the issues when students are not performing as well in language arts or in math, where there is this gap? Right. What do you think should be happening in the classroom itself that could help to bridge that gap? Well, the first thing, and this goes back to the point about assessment. Assessment works best when it's used for diagnostic purposes. That is that we need to do a better job of diagnosing the learning needs of students and then tailoring instruction to meet their needs. Okay. Right? And here we can, that means teachers need to be able to, teachers need to become much more knowledgeable about the learning needs of their students and how to design lessons to meet those needs. So formative evaluation would be a formative positive evaluation. thing, ongoing evaluation. That's okay. right. We can use technology to uh, facilitate more, uh, more individualized approach to learning so that kids can work at their pace and get the kind of, so sometimes it's more, when you have, think about the size of a classroom, their kids are different paces, different learning styles. One teacher may not be able to do it all, but if you use technology effectively, it can enhance what's possible. Does class size matter? Class size absolutely <laughs> matters, especially when you're working with needy children. Okay. I would say if you're working with very high achieving kids, um, you can keep, class size can be 40, 45, right? I mean, I teach courses at NYU. 100 students. They're, these are high oh, they're achievers. all zoning out in the back row. <laughs> well, <I hope> not. <laughs> but, but if you're working with disadvantaged kids or, or kids who are struggling with, with learning to read, then class size really matters. And um, you don't want to, to, to make the classroom too large. You want to create mm -hmm. an environment where the teacher can know the students, have a real sense of where they are. And so, yes, uh, class size is certainly a factor. Jim Carney had the opportunity to visit a school that works. So let's take a look and see what he found. The Medgar Evers College Preparatory School in Brooklyn is a seven-year middle and high school which incorporates a rigorous academic program along with components of the arts and sports. The goal is to prepare students not just to get into college, but to excel in college. Dr. Michael Wiltshire has been the school's principal for the last 10 years. We began our conversation with the school's mission. The old mission of our school is to prepare every single student to be highly successful in college. So essentially the model that we have developed is 6, 7, and 8 early high school where in the 7th grade the students begin to take 5 high school courses and 3 regents examinations and in the 8th grade they um, take the remaining regents in the 9th and 10th they focus on AP courses and then the 11 and 12 they continue with AP but they're able to take um, college courses, undergraduate courses at Medgar. What's the curriculum like at the school? What sort of courses do the students take? Foreign language. In the 6, 7, and 8, we focus on Chinese language and culture. Our goal is for, to have them be proficient in two languages, or fluent in two languages, Chinese and either French or Spanish. And we have developed a sister school in Beijing, China. Um, some of our students will be going there in January. Our physics program is perhaps one of the best program around. Um, this year alone, 84 students took AP Physics. 84 papers were written in AP Physics. Um, so we have debunked all of that theory that says, you know, African-American students can't do physics and the sciences, but they have, and they're doing um, very, very well. And where do the parents play into this? The parents are an instrumental part of our program. Our first major program was um, AP Night, where we invite all the parents to come in um, to meet with the teachers. What are some of the challenges that your faculty and teachers face in uh, closing the achievement gap with these students? Well, um, let us look at the statistics. In New York State last year, only 4,200 African-American students took AP, took one or more AP um, courses. And only 1,000 and I think 21 um, got three or above. 
compare this with the Asian population and the um, um, Caucasian population, this is minuscule. So what we have done, our, in terms of equity, we are above what the state is and maybe the nation in terms of giving students an opportunity to take AP. The other way in which we are closing the achievement gap is our graduation rate. We have, for two consecutive years, we have about 95% of our students graduating. But it's not just graduating, to produce that high quality graduate that is ready to be successful in college. It's, it's a lot of hard work, but what we find is that our students are now becoming extremely competitive. We have students who are admitted into four of the Ivy Leagues, more than one. I mean, NYU has become a regular um, destination for our students, Cornell, Columbia, and so forth. So we are really, really, in a real way, closing the achievement gap. And from the achievers in the Chinese class. From Brooklyn, I'm Jim Carney for EdCast. Along with um, issues of class size and some of the things we've seen in well-performing schools, we've been hearing a lot about charter schools as a, I would use the word panacea, frankly, <laughs> um, because the race to the top is based on mm -hmm. the proliferation of more charter schools. Are charter schools the answer in some way? Well, why would other, they be if they one, are? One of the other things I do is I'm a, a trustee for the State University of New York for SUNY. I chair the committee that authorizes charter schools. So I get to see very closely what's happening with charters. Now, on the one hand, I'm very proud to say that the charters we authorize are generally excellent. They outperform the schools in the neighborhoods where they're located. However, that's not the case uniformly. Right? And that's what we need to realize. There are lots of charter schools that are struggling and that are no better, and in some cases, even worse than the public schools. So why the big emphasis on charter schools? Why are they being presented to people as the panacea? If your child does not have the opportunity to go to a charter school, if you don't have that choice, then it's really bad right. for your child. I think it comes from, again, from the notion that the problem is the teachers' union. Uh, charters are non-union, uh, and uh, typically, not all, but mm -hmm. typically. And I think there's a belief that if you can get rid of the union and, and you can do what you want with the teachers, <laughs> that uh, you can um, uh, create a better school. I'm troubled by that. My son uh, actually teaches at a charter school. What's true for him is true at many charter schools. They are working those people to death. They're working 10, 12-hour days. You can do that with people in their 20s. <laughs> when people start uh, having children, uh, they're going to want a career where they get a chance to have a balanced lifestyle. And what you're seeing a lot of these charter schools is they just turn over the teachers very rapidly. Uh, I'm concerned about the exploitation of teachers in these schools. Uh, so I, I, you know, there are a lot of issues around charters. Uh, there's a lack of transparency in many cases about how they select students. Um, some concern about the... Not, not um, as many non-native speaking students or attending right. charter schools. Or, and special and needs students. Special needs students. Again, that's not to say that we should not have charters. I think we, I, I believe, and what to me, what charters represents is the opportunity to give teachers and principals the chance to create, hopefully, innovative schools around a common vision. Well, you know, we've already heard the buzz. A new film is going to come out called Waiting for Superman. It's done by the person who directed Al Gore's and Inconvenient Truth. And it's going to present, from what I hear, Michelle Rhee, the Chancellor of Washington, D.C., as the goddess, and <laughs> Randy Weingarten as Satan. And this, again, is really focusing on the resistance of the, the perceived resistance of teachers to change and right. charter schools being part of the things that they are resisting. You can see it as a union busting move in some ways and right. sometimes when I see all the Wall Street people behind charter schools I find that d disturbing because right. I'm not sure what they know about education and why they're making such an emphasis on charters. But I think Aside from that debate, then what is it? So a charter school has a longer day, which might conceivably in be many providing cases. students with better or more opportunities for instruction. Are there things we can extrapolate from charter schools that work and instill in the schools that we have now? Yes. Um, in, in, in many cases, in the better charter schools, there are lessons mm -hmm. being learned about how to deliver instruction consistently. So, I, for example, democracy prep in Harlem. I what think I don't know it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think it's a six through twelve school or seven through twelve uh, school in Central Harlem. Uh, it is, uh, I, you know, you go to the classrooms, you see students engaged, and you see high quality instruction being delivered. And each teacher is very clear on the approach that's being taken. 
right? So it's an individualized approach for each student. That's very hard to do in a big class. Not so much, although to some degree in good classrooms, yeah. you, you do want hard. to try to, it's, it is hard, yeah. it requires much more skill on the part of the teacher. But you also, kids benefit from consistency, right? And when the adults are all on the same page with respect to how they will approach the teaching, it makes a huge difference. You've mentioned in one of your articles that there are what you perceive as hidden inequities in schools as well, not so much the obvious ones. What are some of the hidden ones that may, you say it, it's it, there's pervasive. What are some of the things that may not be as obvious to us that, that are also keeping kids back? Well, the most obvious in an urban district is the uh, practice of assigning the least experienced, least effective teachers to the neediest kids. That's probably the mm -hmm. most blatant, and that still happens. Okay. Uh, but beyond that, I would say there's the uh, ways in which we um, will provide uh, a very different kind of instruction to those we perceive to be high achievers. So my son went to Beacon High School, a great school public school. high school right. in Manhattan. His, his curriculum is full of, uh, he's reading uh, Nietzsche in, in, in 10th grade, and he's, you know, it's a rich curriculum full of good literature. It, kids are motivated, they're stimulated, they're really being prepared for college. Let me you play contrast devil's advocate. That. I want to play devil's advocate, I have to, <laughs> sure, because sure. people out there are going to say it. How can I give students who are not reading on level Nietzsche to read? Absolutely. So you, well, how can I get them to be able to read Nietzsche? Because a lot of what we're talking about is minimal performance. Right. And minimal performance is not what it's going to take to really succeed in this world today. So how, right. what can I do to get a student to possibly be able to read Nietzsche by the time they get to high school? Well, you have to start early. <clears throat> you have to meet them where they are. You have to, but you do have to, at a very early age, expose them to good books. I mean, our kids are not getting books in a lot of our schools. They're getting excerpts from books because that's what appears on a test, not real novels, right? We need to cultivate that desire to read very early so that by the time they reach high school, they're able to read uh, a wide variety of literature. So it can happen. I mean, again, there are lots of poor schools in this city that serve poor kids that are doing it. But that idea of how to teach students how to read, do you feel that disadvantaged children need a different kind of pedagogy, or can they... Because you're saying, obviously, mm -hmm. to get away from just a phonics approach or right. being able to expose them to things to read. It's part of the problem that we're really just not giving them the right kind of instruction. Is that what you're saying? That well, I would say that there's no one size that fits okay. all, right? So, right. So, but what, what is not happening sufficiently is that we are not um, uh, carefully assessing the learning needs and responding to those needs with the instruction. And that's, that connection between teaching and learning is where it all happens. We've come through the whole Bush <laughs> era, No Child Left Behind Act. Has it made any progress at all? No Child Left Behind uh, took us a step forward. Okay, and it where took, do you see that? Well, because prior to No Child Left Behind, the prevailing assumption in this country, we weren't concerned about the achievement gap, because we believe that the reason why some kids didn't achieve is because either they were genetically inferior or culturally inferior. Okay, No Child Left Behind did away with that. It said that there's got to be evidence that all children, regardless of their backgrounds, are achieving at the same standards. Um, and President Bush used the term, which I think many people don't even get. He might not have gotten it. Uh, he said it was the soft bigotry of low expectations that was preventing us from doing that. Now, that's pretty powerful. Yeah, that is. But I would say that's soft bigotry. I'm not sure what the difference between soft bigotry and hard bigotry is. But is, it is I would say it <laughs> I guess is... guess he means it's more subtle. <laughs> more maybe, subtle, maybe, maybe. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to ask him. But it's still pervasive. Yes. It's still okay. an issue. And, um, and, it, and it shows up in the lowered standards and lowered expectations. So let's look at the Obama administration. Not coming under total praise for what's happening in education. Yeah. What do you think? Are we headed in the right direction now? Uh, unfortunately, I think they're still, you know, they're still following the path. They, what they don't understand what Secretary Duncan and, and probably the President doesn't understand, is why did No Child Behind work, right? I mean, No Child Behind shifted the focus, but it, it did not, what it ended up doing was, was distorting the curriculum, so we became fixated on test scores. Yes, so disadvantaged children will have even less exposure exactly. to the kinds of things that you think they really need. Exactly. So th now look what we have. We have still have dropout rates of 50% and higher in most cities across the country over eight years after No Child Left Behind. And we have large numbers of kids coming to CUNY from right. New York City public schools who are, who are not prepared, who have to take remedial, basically have to repeat high school. So if there were any clear evidence that what we're doing is wrong, we have it. Okay. 
However, what, what, what the, the administration, and I support this administration, but what they've done is basically kind of just tinkered with No Child Left Behind and, and thrown in a few more charter schools and now want to measure teachers Thank by you. test scores. If you want to get teachers even more focused on test preparation, then judge them by student test scores. We have <laughs> one minute left, so I want to ask you, in your ideal school world, what should we be seeing? What we should be seeing is kids gap. excited about learning, working in the classroom, a lot less lecturing at kids, a lot more active engagement in the classroom, and where kids are being able to see how what they learn in the classroom can impact the world around them. And do you think we can do that? Absolutely. Is We're it, doing it now. Is it a matter of money, or what is it a matter of? It's a matter of will. Generating the will so that particularly the most privileged realize that what happens in our schools today will affect what kind of country we live in perfect way to end and I want to thank you so much for joining us today Professor Noguero of New York University and don't go away we'll be right back with our Ed Bites. We'd like to hear from you if you have any suggestions or comments drop us an email at our email address. Welcome back to this edition of Ed Bites. In a piece provocatively titled the better the student, the better the cheater. EdTech News reports that A and B students cheat more often than weaker students. Reasons for cheating include pressure to keep up with peers and rationalizing behavior, the everybody does it defense. Citing solutions from cheating in school, what we know and what we can do, the report suggests that schools provide an academic environment in which students are told that cheating is wrong and will not be tolerated. Student character should be developed by stressing responsibility, respect, fairness, and honesty. Schools are advised to reduce opportunities for cheating and to acknowledge that the problem does exist. E-readers may not mean the death of reading after all. According to recent surveys, e-books are turning more people into readers. A recent study indicates that people who buy e-readers such as the Kindle and the iPad actually read more than they used to. Amazon says that after buying a Kindle, customers buy over three times as many books as before. Because e-books are so easy to take along, people report they're reading more and at times when a print book isn't as convenient. These include reading e-books in the doctor's waiting room, sitting in a hot tub with an e-book in a Ziploc bag, and on the treadmill with fonts set to extra large. So it seems that more folks will have their noses in books, at least e-ones. Over the decades, New York City education has moved away from K through 8 schools in favor of a shift to middle schools, which are intended to better address the needs of the tween age student. Now comes research indicating that moving to middle school can be more detrimental to students' academic success than staying in a K through 8 school. According to the study, students who go from elementary school to middle school experience a bigger decline in mathematics and language arts achievement than their counterparts in K through 8 schools, and they experience greater rates of absenteeism. With many middle schools beginning as early as fifth grade, it's interesting to note that the gap widens the earlier a student moves to middle school. It may be time to rethink school structure. Today's parents are more connected to their college students than ever before. A new book, The Eye Connected Parent, Staying Close to Your Kids in College and Beyond While Letting Them Grow Up, maintains that through communicative technologies such as cell phones, email, Skype, and Facebook, college students have more contact with their parents than previous generations. While there are many benefits to staying in touch, the authors warn parents to not overdo it. Things to avoid include providing cell phone wake-up calls, reminding students of assignment due dates, and using student email to register for classes. Also, stay out of roommate conflicts. And if you need to be told, your child's Facebook site. That's a little creepy. When I was in school, I didn't see my parents for days and days, and I lived at home. Quite an accomplishment. <laughs> and that's it for this edition of EdCast. Thanks for watching. Until next time, class dismissed.